So as I was saying here, the first thing that you'd like here to check and understand and study is gonna be the materials uh, out of which concrete is gonna be uh, constructed. Uh, I'm talking about anything here related to the reinforced concrete business. Um, when we come to materials, uh, you know, concrete is made out of um, gravel, which is, of course, aggregate. You have sand, which is a fine aggregate. You have cement. You have water to mix it. And if you like to make it reinforced, of course, you're going to be adding some reinforcing. Reinforcing usually is made out of steel, like steel rebars. We call it rebars. So first, we're going to be going through here the materials. And then after that, you go through mechanics of bending. Now, when you have a beam, if you guys recall in mechanics of materials and also in statics, you have studied how to work with beams, how to do analysis on beams, how to figure out the bending moment. And I'm, I'm sure that you guys, you have studied bending moment diagram, shear diagram, and this can be for the forces acting on a beam. So this mechanics of bending, we need to go through it. We need to understand it. So I'm gonna assume here that you guys are familiar with it, but certainly I'm gonna be going through it again just to confirm that we're on the same page. When we do beams, uh, in many cases, we do rectangular beams. Rectangular beam is gonna look like a rectangular section and also concrete slabs. For a concrete slab, you know it's gonna be extended, let's say, in both directions. Like in the plan view, when you look at the plan, and then you see here the concrete slab, let's say 30 feet by 25 feet, this is gonna be, let's say, for one big room, let's say. And let's say it's gonna be bounded by beams. So in this concrete slab, if you like to design it, what you need to do here is take a strip. And if you cut a section through the slab, it's gonna be like rectangular shape with the width that you'd like to consider and the height is gonna be, of course, the thickness of this concrete slab. Same thing when it comes to beams. So when it comes to beams, you're gonna have the beam width and of course, you're gonna have the beam depth. And this way we call it rectangular beam. We're gonna be going through all of this in details. We're gonna see lots of pictures, lots of details but just wanna give you an idea what you're gonna be seeing there. At certain points, you need to study what does it mean by this T-beam, and T-beam means that you're gonna have a concrete slab, and right below it, you're gonna have a concrete beam. This is why we call it a T-beam. Uh, um, in many cases, uh, usually, as you know, concrete is a strong in compression, but it doesn't do well in tension. So we'll come to the tension side of a beam. When we come to the tension side, of the beam, we need to provide some reinforcing to resist the tension. In some cases, we need to provide reinforcing bars. We put it in tension, and then we put some another, some other layer of reinforcing bars on the compression side to help. So in this case, we call it doubly reinforced. So doubly reinforced means that you are going to have rebars in both tension and compression of the beam. You know, in simply supported beam, usually the tension is going to be at the bottom, right? If you have any beam, you put some loads from the top. It's going to be sagging downwards, and in this case, tension is going to be at the bottom, compression is going to be on the top. After that, we need to study beams, like shearing beams. Um, beams, the, the support, I mean, all beams, they support bending moment, and also they the support shear. So when it comes to shear, we need to figure out the shear diagram and how much shear strength do we have in these beams. You know, if you like to design a beam, you need to be able to say that this beam is able to support all the loads. And you know, when you have simply supported beam, let's say, you're gonna have bending moment and also you're gonna have shear. And you wanna be sure that this beam is able to support the bending moment and the shear. So in the first section here, we're gonna be talking about the bending moment that you are supposed to support. And here is gonna be the shear that the beams are supposed to, um, to support. After this, we're gonna be doing the development splice. This development splice is gonna be when you have a rebar and this rebar is not, um, doesn't have the same length as the entire beam. So in this case, you need to splice a bar. There is a certain way of splicing bars. We're gonna be going through this. Um, we're gonna be doing um, the serviceability, which means uh, you understand that beam is gonna be able to support moment and shear and the whole thing, but also when it comes to deflection, you need to be careful. You cannot let the beam deflect a lot, right? You need to control deflection. The beam can be strong to support loads, but deflects too much. So if you see a beam here with loss of deflection, you're gonna be running out of this place, running out of the room. Why? Because the deflection is just excessive and it does not meet the code requirements. We have code requirements that we're gonna be looking at. We need to understand what this means by the serviceability. Serviceability means 
that you need to check stuff besides the strength. So strength means like bending moment, shear, axial load, serviceability means deformation, like vibration. You don't want the structure to vibrate a lot or you don't want it to deflect much. You need to control this. After this, we're gonna do lots of examples. So with that, we're able here to design beams. And then after that, we'll design walls, columns, and then some foundation. Uh, please feel free to ask any question at any time. Um, we're gonna have a project. So certainly we're gonna have homework, right? But at certain point, if I'd like to give you a column to design, I'd rather put it in a project. So when it comes to the column design, you're gonna have the project instead of doing it as a part of the homework, you're gonna be doing it as part of the project. My reason is because I'm gonna give you a building. This building is made out of reinforced concrete structure, the whole thing. I'm gonna ask you at one point to design the slab and then design the beam that support the slab. And then after that, you design the column that support these beams. And then after that, you design the footing. So you're gonna feel that all of these elements are connected to each other. So you will determine the loads on the slab and then take the loads from the slab to the beam and then to the column and then to the footing. With that, it's gonna be much easier for you to understand what's going on. Now we're connecting the, all of these elements to each other and put it in a project. Um, submit of the project is gonna be determined. I'm gonna, after certain time of going through the, the course here, I'm gonna be assigning the project. I'm gonna show you the plan view and some details of the building and give you uh, maybe some information like the trends of, um, of materials, the trends of all the materials, the specifications of the materials, and what type of loads we are supposed to here to resist. Uh, the textbook, um, we have here this ninth edition. This is what we're gonna be using for this book. Reinforced concrete design is gonna be a good book. If you have an older version, it should be fine. Just the difference can be the code version. You know, ACI is American Concrete Institute, right? And um, the ACI 318 is a code number. So ACI, American Concrete Institute. 318 is a committee number. And this committee, their job is to do requirements and design guidelines for enforced concrete members. The 14 is gonna be the year 14. So for example, in the past we used to have 318-11. Now we have more recent codes than 318-14, but we're not gonna be using it. And here's the reason. When it comes to building code, the building code that we use here, according to the ICC and to the state, is gonna be the International Building Code, the IBC. IBC is adopted by the California Building Code. So the CBC, which is California Building Code, they come and say, okay, we're gonna be using the IBC as our code. The IBC or the CPC contains lots of chapters. One chapter talks about the design loads. Another chapter talks about design of wood construction. Another chapter talks about design of reinforced concrete structures. Another chapter talks about design of structures team members. Now, once you go here to the chapter related to concrete design, you're gonna see the whole chapter here. It says, if you like to design a concrete structure, just go ahead and use the ACI 318-14. So the current code that you are using, let's say if you like to submit to a city or to for project, if you like to pull a permit, what you need to do, you design it for the California building code, unless, you are working specifically with the county relay or city relay is gonna be a little bit different. But the, the building code that we use here is gonna be CBC 2019. When you go to CBC 2019, adopts ACI 318 2014. So this why I'm interested in working with this code and not any other codes when it comes to concrete design. Are we good about this or any questions? Hello, anyone here? Sounds good. All right, no questions. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. I put here references. There is a very good book called Park and Bowley. Park and Bowley is a very good book. 
um, I'd recommend that maybe you look for a PDF copy of it, or maybe if you like to be in the structure business, you should have a copy of this book. You need to keep it. This is like, um, it is um, a reddish book, and everybody would call it, this gave you the concrete Bible. So if you like to buy it, buy it and keep it. This gave you very good. At a certain point, you'll come back to it. Um, when it comes to this course, you don't really need it for this specific course, but it is good reference if you can get hold of it and keep it with you. Certain sections, you may go back and look at this and see like more advanced topics when it comes to concrete design and concrete practice. Uh, from time to time, I'm going to be uh, asking for certain ACI structure journal uh, papers. Uh, certainly, I'm going to give it to you. You don't have to get hold of it. I'm going to provide it to you for certain sections uh, during the, this course. For the software, when it comes to your project design, there is a software here called PCA column. This is when this is Portland Cement Association. And if you like to design a column, you can test it. Uh, it is user friendly um, software. You model the column, you put the reinforcing, you put the material, you put the Excel load, and then the software is going to be doing the design for you. It's going to be very good if you can get hold of it and maybe test it when it comes also to your project. CSI column is the same, same software. I mean, very similar software. This from Computer Structures Incorporation. And this is the same as SAP 2000. If you guys are aware of SAP 2000 or ETAPS, the software, like this SAP 2000 and ETAPS, is the same company, CSI. Or maybe RAM Structures. It, it, it has the same thing. It has the same software. This software should be good for this course. So for this level, if you can test some of this software, it's going to be good for you so that you don't just do the stuff by hand. Also, you have been exposed to some software for concrete design. Um, for the homework, you have 10% for the homework. Project classroom participation is going to be 15%. We have two exams, and then you have final exam. Any questions? From this. Sounds good. Right, very good. For the office hour, it's gonna start once we are done with this course here. Tuesdays, it's gonna be 5.15 to 6.15. So once I'm done, you can just click on this and join the meeting if you have any questions. Um, the syllabus also, I have a PDF copy of it right here. Exams. I'm not sure if you guys have heard about this before. Victoria? Yeah. Yes. Use it before? Mm -hmm. Yes. Would you like to tell us your experience with it? I haven't used it before. Same. All right. Anyone would like to share the experience? Um. So I barely used it this summer in 302. And um, basically what it does, it records your screen and it like tracks your eye movement. All right. um, and like if you do something suspicious, it'll flag it. Um, and like it'll show like what part of the recording, like the time. And the professor, I guess, can look at that and he can determine if the person was cheating or not. Um, it was kind of redundant in some cases because some exams, like especially for theory two, they were open note. So like you're doing the exam and it's like, you know, you're not supposed to look at anything according to proctorial, but it's an open note exam. So that was kind of a bit of a can of worms, but um, it wasn't too bad. Yeah, thank you for the insight. Um, what I'm thinking also about is once we are done with each exam, I'm going to be assigning here a certain time, maybe 10, 15 minutes with each one of you guys. I know we have, um, we have many people here. So after the exam, I'd like to talk to you and go with you through um, the exam. So I guess we can have uh, a separate or private uh, Zoom meeting with each one and just go with, with you guys through it and be sure that you understand what you have done in there. Um, 
I guess with that, uh, I should be able to determine whether you guys, you really understand the subject or this is gonna be something that, um, that you don't know. And based on this, I'm gonna be confirming the grade. So I want you guys to be ready for this. So it's gonna be after the exam and after grading, I'm gonna be talking to you and going with you through it. All right. Um, uh, professor, I do have one question. Yeah. Uh, will we need to have our cameras on at all uh, during the class or only just for exams? It's gonna be during the exams, um, but um, you know, you can be sitting in an actual classroom and you can be just sitting there doing nothing and no concentration at all and not getting anything of what I'm talking about. So actually, I just leave it up to you guys. Um, if you give it enough attention, you'll know what you are talking about. And um, whatever that I cover here in this lecture or in lectures, generally speaking, is giving the exam. So if you missed what I'm saying here, I mean, you lose. It is not me, usually. Because the exam is going to be based on the lectures and based on the material that I cover here. So I want to be sure, guys, that you give it enough attention and please study the material. Don't just think now, this is going to be so simple, it is easy. Um, I'm going to have all the material I can study later on uh, because usually you won't. You'll feel lazy to study. I've been there before, so I know what I'm talking about. Okay, thank you. No problem. All right. Types of concrete. Now, here's a quote that I'm talking about. CBC 2019, the California Building Code. This chapter called Chapter 19 in the code. So this chapter of the CBC is about concrete. And in this chapter here, adopts the ACI 310-14. And they say that we have two types of concrete. We have plain concrete and we have reinforced concrete. So what's plain concrete? What's reinforced concrete? I guess difference here is gonna be the reinforcement that you put in there. If you have reinforcement, you're gonna be calling it reinforced concrete. If there is no reinforcement, you're gonna be called plain concrete. Now the question is, can I just add any amount of reinforcing in the concrete member? And the answer is no. There is a minimum amount of reinforcing that you need to add to structural members made out of concrete to call it reinforced concrete member. This is why it says here concrete without reinforcement or with reinforcement ratio less than the minimum required by code. So code says, let's say it's gonna say, this is the minimum reinforcement you need to provide. It's gonna be this much. And of course they give it to you by ratio, right? So you need to provide this reinforcement. Otherwise, if you did not provide it, we're gonna consider it to be plain concrete. So plain concrete may consider some reinforcing, but it's gonna be below the minimum amount required by code, if this makes sense to you. If you have reinforcement equal to minimum reinforcement ratio or more, you can call this reinforced concrete member or structure. Plain concrete usually we use it for pavement and for slabs. Go ahead. I hear someone wants to say something. Um, my question is, um, is there such thing as too much reinforcement? Like uh, to, to the Yes, in the past, there used to be in the older code versions, um, there used to be a maximum amount of steer ratio that you cannot put in reinforcement beyond that. But in recent codes, they start to change this and they say, okay, you're gonna be adding all this reinforcing, but you're not gonna be using um, the benefit out of it. So for example, you have 10 rebars and we're gonna consider it for you as six rebars. So they are not gonna be doing much for you. So you'd rather not to add it. Or waste money, like adding too much. Yeah, you're adding. Course, basically. Unless, unless you have a problem with the depth of the beam and we're gonna be going through this later. I mean, okay. it's all the restrictions and you really have to do this. Otherwise, your instruction member is not working fine. Okay, thank you. In plain concrete, I'm gonna say like concrete slabs, like pavement, when you do it in pavement. For reinforcement, let's say here's a beam. So we're gonna have longitudinal bars through the beam and then maybe some tires. Materials. We need the cement. Cement is gonna be very important, right? You need to have the cementitious material. It's gonna be like hydraulic cement, or it's gonna be cement like powder cement, or other materials that's called cementitious materials. You need to have fine aggregate, like the sand, you need to have coarse aggregate. Coarse aggregate is gonna be like the gravel or the rock. Certainly also you need to add water to it. With this, you have reinforced, you have concrete, just concrete mix, right? 
in order for you to do a good concrete mix, you need to control the amount of water ratio that you have there. Use the water to cement by weight. It's gonna be about maybe 40% to 50% by weight, which means if you have, let's say 10 pounds of, of cement, you need to add five pounds of water. But this amount of water is not enough to make it fluid and to be able to use it and pour with it, you know, and, and pour it easily in forms. Is that where you start adding the admixtures to kind of evaporate the water? Absolutely. So the admixtures at this point is gonna be needed. So instead of adding lots of water, because adding lots of water is gonna be reducing um, the strength. So in this case, you start here to add the mixture to reduce the amount of water. Also admixtures are used to control lots of other stuff. Let's say that you are putting concrete and it's very cold weather. Uh, let's say maybe about 30 degrees or so Fahrenheit. So in a case like this, uh, what you need to do is to add some admixtures. So admixtures has useful um, intent. Um, I see here a question about how to access the software. To access the software, you should have it um, in the university. You should have an access to it. Let me show you this because you have lots of software. I want to be sure that you guys you know about this and you go through it. I know that there is a section about software. I want you please to click on this. Look at the software available to you guys. See this? So we have here, for now, I'm gonna be just putting here two chapters, not three chapters of the ACI itself. So the ACI, when it comes to materials, we have chapter 19 and 20. 19 is gonna be about concrete, 20 is gonna be about the reinforcing bars. Now let's talk about the cement. What cement is allowed to be used? Portland cement need to comply with the STM C150. Are you guys familiar with the STM? The, the, the meaning and the use of the STM? If anyone has an idea, if you can give us some insight, please. Go ahead. Okay. I don't have anyone who would like to speak here. So the STM is American. standards for testing and materials. This organization here, they issue lots of reports and specifications. If you like to call it, it's called the specification. Within the specification here, this C150, you're gonna see what does it mean by Portland cement? How do you take any material? So you understand, let's say it's gonna be a powder material, the Portland cement. Why would you call this Portland cement? What testing you need to do on this material to confirm that this is Portland cement? What is the chemical composition? How it looks like, colors, um, texture, the whole thing. You're gonna see it all in this ASTM C150. For blended hydraulic cement, you need to go to ASTM C595, and then you need to look at everything there, and then if you'd like to qualify this material to be called hydraulic cement, you need to go there and confirm this based on testing. Uh, so the C150 just stands for uh, it, everything, the color, the, the texture, and everything? The, the C150 here, it is mm -hmm. a document, six to seven pages usually. I don't recall the exact number of pages in this C150. You're going to see all the information about this Portland cement. Right, and just the name Portland is just the name of the type of cement, not like a company who makes it, correct? No, no, this is very general. No, this is generic. Mm. This name okay. is uh, from the, I guess, uh, from the 20s. Since then, they'll be called Portland Cement. 
So this is old name. All right, also fly ash. Fly ash is used also as part of the cementitious materials and has certain specifications and information if you like to go with it. Silica fume and fly ash in the past, they used to throw it. Now they use it to substitute the cement because the problem with cement, it caused lots of shrinkage to the concrete and shrinkage means cracks. So to reduce the amount of shrinkage and cracks in concrete, they added fly ash and silica fume to a certain percentage of the cement. Let's say 20% of the cement is gonna be like fly ash or silica fume. And with that, you have the same effect. At the same time, you reduce the amount of shrinkage and cracks. Here is a Portland cement. Comes like this to use it in patch planet or it comes like in bags. This is usually the standard way that you're going to be able to see it. If you are in, uh, let's say, walking in the Home Depot, this is the way that you see it. But when it comes to um, the supplier or the producer of the concrete, it's going to come to them like this in trucks. Types of, types of cements, the two main types that you're going to be working with or using it out in the industry is going to be type 2, which is a general one, type 2, or type 5. Type two is like general use cement. This is what you're gonna see everywhere. And this gave you the cheapest cement that you can ever find. Type five is gonna be high sulfate resistant cement. You will use this usually in foundation if the soil reports say that you have lots of sulfates in the soil. So certainly you'd like to use type five. And also if you have a bending close to the ocean and you have lots of corrosive environment, certainly you're gonna be using this type five. Rest of the types is not really critical to know about, but if you like, you can take your time and study about them if you want to. But just, you know, for your uh, practice here, it's gonna be type two or type five. For the aggregate, you cannot just use any aggregate. The aggregate needs to be clean of chlorides because the problem with chlorides is gonna be rusting of the reinforcing bars. Don't forget, if you add any chlorides to the mix, to the concrete mix, you're going to have a problem here with rusting of the rebars. So the aggregate needs to comply with the STMC33. And we have two types of aggregate, generally speaking. We have the fine aggregate and the coarse aggregate. We have an aggregate that's to be called here normal weight aggregate. So this rock is normal weight. What does it mean by normal weight? I'm going to be going through this. Also, I have lightweight. So we have lightweight aggregate and normal weight aggregate. Lightweight aggregate is preferred when the building is too heavy and you like to reduce the force because you know the forces and the loads that this building is going to be supporting is going to be dead load, life load, and seismic. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys hear about this stuff yet, but we're going to be going through it. So reducing the weight of the structure is something good that you, you, you'd like to have if you can. The fine aggregate, as we know, it's gonna be sand, and you need to be sure that it doesn't have any fine particles. For example, you don't wanna see lots of clay or chlorides or silt. I'm sure that you guys are aware you have taken maybe some soil mechanics course, you know the definition of clay and definition of silt. You don't want to see any clay or any organic materials in the sand, and also you don't wanna see any chlorides in there. And also you need to have certain grading, you know, when it comes to the sieve analysis, have you guys taken the sieve analysis? Yes, no? Which, which analysis, I'm sorry? No. Analysis. No. No, I don't recall, no. Okay. Um, have you taken soil mechanics class? Yes. No. Okay. Yeah. So I'm enrolled in it. Yeah, okay, all right, maybe, so it's coming. The sieve analysis, you're gonna bring a sample here of the soil, you put it on the top of the... Of a oh, sample. sieve, you said, right? You have a shaker, right? Sometimes it's gonna be manual shaker, sometimes it's gonna be mechanical shaker. And um, you're gonna see here the soil is kind of separated into, let's say, different size, right? Depends on the sieve. Um, so there should be certain grading requirements when it comes to the aggregate. You cannot have lots of very fine particles and no coarse particles. So there should be certain percentage of each, of each size. That's what I'm talking about. So I'm not gonna be going here in details, but I'm gonna let go for now. And once you study soil and you understand 
the grading and the sieve analysis, you know exactly what I'm talking about. For the course aggregate, same thing. It needs to be clean. No chlorides is allowed. No clay or silt needs to be attached to it. Chlorides is gonna be really bad. And look at this. It says here, clean of chlorides as it is harmful to reinforcement. It's gonna be causing rusting of the reinforcing. You don't want this to happen. Now, when it comes to this course aggregate, we're talking about rock. So the problem is, can I go with very fine rock? So the question is, what do you mean by very fine rock? Um, the fine rock in this case is gonna be the maximum aggregate size in this case gonna be three eighths of an inch. This is what we call here P gravel. And in this case, you have no problem with this. Three eighths of an inch should be able to fit within the formwork. You know, when you look here at this, um, beam that you're looking at don't forget that you're going to have some form work around it and then you have certain rebar spacing right from this rebar to this rebar when you pour the concrete also from this tie to this tie so we have this issue here about the spacing between the rebars and the size of the aggregate so when it comes to the maximum aggregate size it needs to be smaller than all of this is gonna be one fifth of the smallest dimension between side of forms. So for example, if the beam width is gonna be 12 inch, you take this 12 inch divided by five, with that is gonna be, let's say 12 divided by five is gonna be what? It's gonna be a little bit larger than two. So which means fine, three eighths of an inch is gonna work. So what are the others, what is the maximum size that you usually use? Gonna be the question. When it comes to foundation, usually we use one size, one, one inch aggregate size. This gonna be the maximum. Come to beams and columns usually with three quarter of an inch for the maximum aggregate size. Look here, it says one third of the slab depth. Slab thickness, it goes, it starts maybe at eight inches and sometimes go to three inches if it's gonna be like a topping and goes all the way to maybe 16 inch. So if you go here to six inch or three inch, divide this by three, it's gonna be an inch. So in a case like this, three quarter of an inch should be fine. Three quarter, the minimum clear bar spacing. So let's say the rebar to the rebar spacing, let's say about eight inches. Three quarter of this is gonna be six inches. We are talking about three quarter of an inch. This should be fine. So the problem is you don't want the concrete to be congested, right? If you have lots of rebars and then you put the concrete in there and rock is gonna get stuck, you're gonna have problems here because you're gonna have voids within the concrete member, even though that use vibrators and the whole thing. But this is not gonna be good. So you wanna be sure that the maximum aggregate size is gonna be within all of this three values. Now, normal weight aggregate versus lightweight aggregate. We're talking here about the rock. The normal weight aggregate, it has a unit weight, which is this gamma here, of 140 pounds per cubic foot. If you use this, and you'd like to do concrete out of it, unit weight concrete, in this case, it's gonna be 145 to 150. So the question is, what is this and what is that? This one, the 140 PCF, is gonna be for the aggregate itself, for the rock. This one here, 150 PCF, is gonna be the weight of the concrete itself, the entire concrete. So this concrete here, including what? This will include the rock, the sand, the cement, and the reinforcing, the whole thing. So if you like to figure out the weight of one cubic foot of concrete, one cubic foot of concrete, the weight, 150 PCF, pound per cubic foot. So it's gonna be 150. So let's say that you have the column. The column is two feet by two feet, and the height is 10 feet. So I'm gonna say the column is gonna be two by two, it's gonna be four times 10. I have a person coming in. It's gonna be 400 cubic feet. Take this 400 cubic feet, multiply by 150, it's again the weight of this column. The other aggregate we have, yes, go ahead. I see someone wants to ask. Questions? All right. Lightweight aggregate, it has a unit weight of the aggregate itself, it's gonna be about 70 pounds per cubic foot. If used in the concrete mix, this will result in lightweight concrete that has a unit weight of 110 to 115 PCF. 
it depends on exactly the type of concrete that you're going to be using, type of aggregate, which means it's going to be much lighter. Look at this ratio here. You compare here 150 to 115 or 110. There is a big difference between the two weights. So, water. What is the specification that you'd like to know about the water? Please let's find this ACMC 1602M. This water should be clean. There shouldn't be there any oil, acids, salts, organic materials, such as any organic material, like for example, clay with some roots or whatever. Sugar, you cannot put in there any sugar. Just, you know, a spoon of sugar, if you put it in one cubic yard of concrete, is gonna destroy it. You're gonna have nothing. You can just throw it in the trash. You cannot really use it if you put just one spoon of sugar. Also, you cannot have there any chlorides in the water. So the water needs to be clean. Otherwise, you're gonna have trouble here with the concrete. Uh, why does the sugar destroy the concrete? Is it because a chemical reaction between the cement or the rebar? The rebar and the cement, for example. Uh, the chlorides, the problem with chlorides, you may have very strong concrete, but if you have any reinforcing, the reinforcing can get rusty. So the chloride, generally speaking, once you say here chlorides, about rusting over steam. The other stuff here, like oil, acids, alkali, like salt and organic material, this here is going to do deep bond between the concrete particles, between the rock itself, and between the cement around it. Mm -hmm. So this again gets you cracked concrete. The concrete itself is going to be very weak. So all of these items that I'm talking about here, if you have it, you're going to have very weak concrete. Chlorides, you're going to be rusting of the rebars. For the admixtures, there are reasons to add this admixtures. Like for example, you add this air and trained admixtures. You add it for workability and also for the freeze. If you work here in a very cold environment, you'd like to add this air and in training admixtures. It's gonna be very useful for you. Also, they increase the workability. And once you increase the workability, you can reduce the amount of water. You know, when you have lots of water in the concrete mix, the concrete strength is gonna drop down. So you'd like to optimize it. To optimize the amount of water there, it needs to be between 40% to 50% of the cement weight. So if you'd like to increase workability without increasing the amount of water there, you need to add some admixtures. Silica fume and fly ash, this is a substitute to the cement. It's good that you have it there because you reduce the shrinkage and give it the same strength. So actually this gave you a plus, this gave you a benefit. Uh, shrinkage means what? It means cracks. Also you have this plus the sizers, you can add it for, to increase the workability. So either it's gonna be air and train that pictures or it's gonna be plus the sizers to increase workability. All right, how would you mix it? If you have a small patch that you'd like to do next to your house, you can do some little work like this and just have a small mixer, but you are gonna have a patch planet, like a big mixer like this. And of course, each one of the silos will include, let's say aggregate, the other one is gonna be fine aggregate, coarse aggregate, cement, two different types of cements, is mixed by a computer system. And then at the end, you have here the concrete truck, just take the concrete and deliver it to the job site. Uh, professor? Yes. Uh, with the last slide, you mentioned um, uh, some plasticides. Yes. Plasticizers. Yes. Uh, so is that like a, a fiber reinforced concrete? No, plasticizer is different. Usually plasticizers, they come as liquid. Mm -hmm. Like they come either in barrels or in gallons. Uh, usually it's going to be like five gallon container. And this is if you like to do it on the side yourself. Mm. You like add some. Let's say that you're doing some work like this and you like to add it, right? Um, in most cases, it's going to be part of this. And you receive it as in perils, you put it in a, in a good size tank, and they just add it there. They add the plasticizer. So plasticizer uses going to be like liquid. Okay? Okay, thanks. No problem. All right, now concrete properties. What concrete properties do we have in there? Uh, we are talking about strength. That's what we care about. When we do structure design, I care about the stress-strain relationship with concrete. This when I do calculations. So I need to know what concrete strength. I'm sure that you guys have heard about 
3,000 PSI conflict or 2,500 PSI conflict. So now we need to understand what information is useful to us when we come to conflict design out of this stress strain relationship. The ACI says concrete strength needs to range from 2,500 to 5,000 5, PSI. This is what we care about. If the concrete strength is going to be less than 2,500 PSI, I'm not going to use it. This is what the code says. If it's going to be more than 5,000, I can use it, but I'm going to consider only 5,000. So 5,000 is going to be the maximum number that you can use in your analysis. But if the strength, let's say, is 6,000, use it as 5,000. But if the concrete strength is less than 2,500, I cannot use it as a structure concrete in my design of my analysis. I need to reject it. So what does it mean by 2,500 PSI concrete is 5,000? Now let's look here at the stress-strain relationship. The way we test concrete, we're going to be testing compression. Compression means what? Means a cylinder, concrete cylinder, we put in the machine, we start to test it. And then we look at the stress versus the strain. Here is the stress, 1000 PSI, 2000, which means KSI, H1000 PSI means 1 KSI, all the way to 6000 PSI. On the x axis, I have the strain. The strain is unitless, it has no units. It says here 0 0.001, 0 0.002, 3, and 4. So let's say you bring a concrete that's going to break at 4,000. What does it mean by break at 4,000? It means the maximum strength that the machine is going to be recording for you is going to be this 4,000. So actually this line here is going to be the performance of the concrete, the 4,000 concrete. It's a stress strain relationship. So you start to put here some stress, you have strains, and at the beginning here you have this elastic, after this it's gonna be less plastic performance. Once it reaches 4,000 PSI, the strength is gonna drop, and you're gonna see lots of strains. And failure most likely is gonna happen, let's say, at about 0 0.004 strain level. SI could say concrete is not gonna be useful once it reaches 0.03. So once you approach here, 0.03, concrete is not good. This for all concretes. So as it says here, ACI 318 assumes a maximum ultimate concrete strain of 0.03. But when you do testing, concrete should be able to take more than 0.03. The code understand this. But what they are telling you, once it reaches 0.03, we consider the concrete is not good anymore. And this gonna be your ultimate point. So out of this diagram, I have two pieces of useful information. Number one is give you the maximum stress of the concrete. This is what you call here the trends of the concrete, which is in this case, let's say for this graph, is going to be for 4,000 PSI concrete. And the other piece of information is giving you the strain. The strain for all concrete is going to be considered to be 0.03, even though that concrete is going to be able to take higher strains. For this, all of this concrete, if you like to figure out the weight again, for normal weight, it's going to be 150. For lightweight, it's going to be 110. So if you don't know and you have a homework or you have an exam or you are practicing and you need to figure out the weight, whether this is construction site or you are doing structure analysis and you need to figure out the weight. If you have been told that you are going to have here normal weight concrete and you need to figure out the weight of the concrete, Let's say that you're on construction site and you work for a contractor and you're supposed to design the formwork. So the weight can be determined by figuring out the volume of the concrete. You multiply by 150 if you have normal weight concrete and 110 if you have lightweight concrete. These two numbers are kind of typical standard and you can use them safely. If you are doing structural design, this is gonna be the same two numbers that you need to use in your analysis. Okay, this is copy and paste from the ACI code itself. It's gonna be about the concrete design properties. You have the minimum concrete strength, 2,500 for normal weight. 
special moon frame. It goes from lightweight 3,000, 5,000. Let's give you the two numbers, 2,500 and 5,000. I guess I will need to stop at this point since so the time is almost there. And I want to be sure that you guys are aware of the homework. Many have seen it. Homework is going to be simple. We're going to be taking you here back to structure analysis. The simple, I need here you to do the shear force diagram and minimum diagram for the three problems. It's going to be a good exercise for you guys. Either that you can type here on the PDF if you want to, or you can print it, do your analysis, do your solution, draw it, scan it, and send it in PDF. You don't send it in an email. I want you please to read this. Go through this submission. Or submissions via email are not accepted. So be sure that you don't email it to me. There's a way to upload it. So if you like, um, I'm gonna stop at this point here. And I want you please to type your name in your way out. And if you have any questions, um, like continue, I'm gonna be open now the office hour. And you can do that easily by just starting here the office hour and ask me your questions. You guys have a good day. Uh, professor, I have a question. Um, uh, last semester due to the change um, to virtual, uh, how did your class fare versus uh, pass? Uh, was the class average a lot lower or about the same? It's about the same because you know what happened um, in the second half of March, we start to have the virtual. And just amazing that, that I looked at performance of the students and everything, right? Because I have known them, I have lots of people that I have known. And um, it was after the first midterm. And the second midterm grade was very close from the first midterm grade. I feel that there is no difference. It went very good. Perfect. Looking forward to the semester. Thank you so much for also adding to your class. Mm, no problem. Thank you. All right. See you uh, Thursday. All right. See you soon. Okay, bye.